and welcome to another Looting Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for Love Lawn Leghorn and with me today is someone who loves being on these tracks, my good friend Eli Copperman. Say hi. Yes. And that's the right response right there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, thank you for having me, me back, Anthony. I got to say, it feels nice to look at uh, another cartoon from Robert McKimson, the vastly underappreciated Robert McKimson. We'll obviously talk more about him later in this cartoon, but any chance I have to, to talk about the work from uh, this criminally underrated filmmaker in animation is always a bonus to me. So just a few bits of info to get underway. So as mentioned, this is Love Lawn Leghorn, released on the 8th of September 1951. It had a blue ribbon reissue sometime in 1960. It's the 629th in the series and it's directed by, as you've already mentioned, Bob McGimson. You can find this on the Looney Tunes Platinum Collection Volume 1 DVD and Blu-ray set and looks fantastic. It's definitely worth watching there. Now, in case you haven't seen this short, because I can't show you the full thing on YouTube due to copyright, but... Chrissy is on the hunt for a husband and he's armed with her rolling pin. Sounds like my wife. <laughs> After trying to catch Foghorn, Foghorn convinces her that the dog is really a rooster in disguise, so she tries to catch him. <laughs> Soon, I say sooner or later, she's bound to try to get him out of that dog suit. Then whoa -ho -ho, Nelly! A few bits of trivia actually for this one. So first of all, this is the first pairing of Falkhorn, Leghorn and Prissy. Now Falkhorn of course has been around for a little while now, but Prissy was only in one short prior called An Egg Scramble and was paired with Porky in that one. And from here on, she'll be part of the Falkhorn, I don't know, franchise, universe, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> the Foghorn Cinematic Universe. As we there like we go, it. there we go. They did it before Marvel. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Where... You know, in some shorts, she'll be pursuing Falkhorn. Other shorts, Falkhorn pursues her. But she's now part of this, as you say, cinematic universe. The book that she's reading in the beginning, it says Live Alone and Hate It. Now, that's actually a play on a real book. It's called Live Alone and Like It by Marjorie Hills. And that was published in 1936. And that was basically like a, I guess, a guide for single women at the time. I mean, I haven't read it. But from what I understand, yeah, it's just this playful little guide. And it's interesting because that book would have been released at a time where women were essentially expected to marry and have children. That was their well, their role um, at the time. I love how we're talking about this trivia during Women's History Month. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, hey, don't, <laughs> don't, don't throw your uh, rotten vegetables at me, folks. I'm just telling you like how it was. I'm not... <laughs> I'm not condoning, yeah, exactly. I'm not. I'm not condoning that that should be the case now. I'm just saying that that's why it was okay. But also, the one thing that people may not be aware of, because they might think there's just, I suppose, gibberish looking, I guess. But it's when you see Falcon playing with some string and making all these patterns. That's actually a game called Cat's Cradle. But usually, it's played by two people, where the other person would use their fingers and clamp the string in a certain way, and then make another pattern, and then you keep going until you do the final pattern. So that's what that is. But it's also funny that Prissy makes musical notes on the string when she gets it, and that just shows why HD transfers are so great because you can see those little details that uh, you might have missed originally so there you go god bless the modern restorations that's right and i know that you, you were happy to hear the cat's cradle was in this one because i know that's what you play all the time um oh every with your day. friends at uni that's it. it that's right you know your phone screams for you to look at it but no no it's cat's cradle <laughs> for you it's all about the cat's cradle you know and i, and I heard that you're going to start up a youtube channel called eli's cat's cradle corner so yeah, there you go. <laughs> so with this short now, this one, again, much like the Sylvester Tweedies at this period of time, the, these earlier Falkhorns, I revisit them. I, Admittedly, I'm kind of dismissive of a lot of them. I do like Falkhorn as a character, but I find a lot of them blend together. But revisiting these, they're really, really good. And this one's no exception. Um, what did you think of this one? Yeah, I, I, I enjoy the, these ones. I'm not the biggest fan of Falkhorn Leghorn, but I think what makes a, a lot of his cartoons enjoyable to me is... I don't know if I've ever said this before, but what I've always enjoyed about Robert McKimson's cartoons is that he always found a, a way to make a, a lot of characters just be themselves and really play out their, I guess, eccentricities and bad habits to such a big degree. I don't rem remember who said this, but 
I think somebody described Robert McKimson. It, 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 it might have actually been Bob Clampett now that I think about it, but someone to describe Bob McKimson as this dapper, subtle man in a world of really harsh, loudmouth people. And I think that's what he wanted to get in a lot of his cartoons. So if you see a cartoon like this where Foghorn Leghorn is this like really obnoxious loudmouth who wants nothing better to do than to tassel with his foe on the barnyard dog and then all of a sudden this kind of lonely female hen wants to find a husband and she finds that in foghorn you kind of see how uh, mckimson like to dabble in the strangest of character tropes and strangest of eccentricities in, in, in a given character and what they wanted and I, I think this cartoon is a good example of the types of crazy shenanigans that would happen in those types of scenarios. I, I get such a big kick out of the barnyard dog uh, messing up Foghorn's plans for the better. Because let's be honest, Foghorn deserves what he gets at the end for the better. Not just for Prissy, but also for a, a sort of ending the feud between him and the dog for the safety of the barn, if you think about it. One thing that struck me as interesting about this one, because I've been watching these in order, that I just love yeah, how the dog just is the one that actually instigates the whole thing. Like, he's the one oh, yeah. that actually starts it off. You know, usually he starts off with Foghorn just messing with the dog. In the well, in fairness, even Walkie Talkie Hockey, like it begins with the dog smashing a watermelon on Foghorn, you know? Of course, but it's always a, a delight to see something, you know, a little bit of a role reversal that we're going to start now with the dog messing with Foghorn and, you know, Foghorn's oh. just chilling like he's on the beach. I don't know why he's like that, but thinking he's on the beach. But anyway, he's probably far inland and will never get to a beach in his lifetime. But anyway, one of the things I really enjoy is Bea Benadera's voice. She does the voice of all the hens, including, of course, right. Miss Prissy. And, you know, if you're familiar with the Flintstones like I am, you can just hear her voice and you it's just amusing to hear <laughs> the different hands sounding like the incidental characters that she'll be voicing on the, the Flintstones later on. Now, I've got to ask, though, I mean, was bashing men on the head with rolling pins a thing? That's what I've always wondered, too. Where did that come chicken, from? Well, speaking of chicken cartoons, there's these rather uh, not very good cartoons from the famous studios. Um, I... I will admit I'm more fond of that studio now than when I was younger, but I think somebody said it perfectly. If you watch like the Herman cartoons with this character, Henry Rooster or whatever. Now, unlike those cartoons where his wife is just this horrible person who was clearly probably created by these depressed alcoholics who just had these really misogynistic views on women and just want to make them as bad people who just beat up their husbands who are miserable anyway. This cartoon... Prissy's just kind of naive and innocent and just wants to find someone for herself. And the rolling pin just feels like a funny little, little, little touch to what could have easily been a mean spirited tone, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I like this Prissy character. You know, she just wants a husband and she gets misled along the way. And it's funny how she ends up with the husband who was misleading her in the beginning. So we all know that this relationship will. <laughs> long time won't it because that that whole rolling pin on the head thing i think it's used more when it comes to the husband but, but i do like what Falcon says he says uh, you know you don't bash him on the head with the rolling pin and he goes <laughs> and then he breaks the fourth wall that comes later <laughs> well you're going about it all wrong girly you don't bat him on the bean with a rolling pin that comes later. That's that, my favorite line. <laughs> that's boomer humor in a nutshell. One of those gags where it's just like, okay, okay. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's old one. But, you know, you know course, your dad's going to get a big kick out of it. Exactly. And, you know, and of course, his, his sayings are pretty great in this one too. Like, of course, the best one being, you know, nice girl, but sharp as, but sharp as a sack of wet mice. Nice girl, but about as sharp as a sack of wet mice. <laughs> Actually, uh, going in, into that, uh, I don't know if that was done by Rod Scribner or not, but even if it wasn't, I do want to say I've come to appreciate Rod Scribner a lot, not even so much from the work he did for Bob Clampett and all that, because especially during that time, Robert McKimson's direction was a bit tighter and a lot more controlled than a, like Tex or Bob Clampett and all that. And you can tell that Rod Scribner was 
suffering under McKimson's direction. But honestly, I kind of enjoy his animation under the early to mid 50s Robert McKimson cartoons solely for the fact that you can still identify what his work is. It's super loose, very free flowing, but here it feels a bit more contained. So it feels a lot less wild for the sake of it, if that makes sense. I feel like a lot of Rod Scribner's animation, as gorgeous as it is, it kind of gets lost in clarity. And here, because everything is a bit more controlled, you're able to see the animation in a more grounded sense. And I know a lot of animation fans will probably want my blood for saying that, especially under McKimson's direction and with the other credited animators, you know, Phil Delara, Charles McKimson and all that. Everything feels a bit more defined. And, and also speaking of animation, I mean, the skin being where how she's trying to take off the skin of the dog thinking that there's a rooster underneath oh my <laughs> you know how tricky it is to animate all those wrinkles <laughs> oh my god that must have been a nightmare to in between let alone ink and paint yeah exactly so it's just <laughs> oh, it, uh, it's just incredible especially look at it in slow motion too which i've done and it's just absolutely incredible I, and i love the animation of the melon dance I mean, I how I love that. It's just, it's just so ridiculous. Like, yeah, give it, <laughs> give it the air, give it the air, and, and she's just doing that um, dance with the whole. I forgot what the song is called, but gotta love the ending. Which look, the cynic in me is thinking, yeah, this gag was probably done just also to maybe save a bit of money because you don't have to animate much. But the whole Rube Goldberg machine that we oh, see at the end—that's a brilliant touch. Like, it's so elaborate and it's so pretentiously elaborate that it's funny. If that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And it's fantastic. Again, you can sort of be cynical and say, okay, was that done just to save a few dollars in animation? Because you just see a few times Falcon turning his head and, you know, then we just see basic animation. But you know what? It's just so funny that all this elaborate set up just for one little clunk at the end with the, <laughs> <laughs> the bowling ball at the end, which is fantastic. I think a lot of why people don't tend to look at the Foghorn Leghorn cartoons with much excitement is solely because after Henry Hawk, they just kind of became generic like barn cartoons. But if you look at cartoons like this, especially with eccentric characters like Miss Prissy, the Weasel, and even the occasional appearances from more recurring characters like Daffy Duck and all that, you can really see how much Foghorn would stand out in a, what would seemingly be a pretty grounded world. He's just such an obnoxious schnook. As that cartoon says, he's just a loudmouth schnook. And those cartoons, especially after Henry Hawk, they kind of stand out more so from the characters who enable Foghorn for the worse, so to say. So in terms of rating, look, I'm giving this one oh, about an 8 out of 10. It's not one that I perhaps will revisit all the time. And yeah. look, there are some better Foghorns out there, but I think 8 out of 10 is a nice score. It's a funny one, a good way to waste, I guess, seven minutes of your time. And yeah, you'd be left smiling by the end of it. So yeah, 8 out of 10. Yeah, um, I, how would you rate I it? I give this one five stars out of five. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. letterbox, nah, it's you're, more rebellious. Like... you're the rebellious member of this little uh, group that That's we have. That's right. <laughs> Nah, like, it's 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 more like three and a half out of five. It's it, it's pretty enjoyable. Not the best Foghorn cartoon, but especially compared to what we would get a little later on, it's pretty enjoyable. Yeah, exactly. So we'll wrap it up there. So thank you guys for watching, and until next time, take care. I say, I say, see you later, folks. Bye bye. There, that is. Chrissy, what do you got in the market basket, dearie? A husband. Yeah, I'll say, uh, yes! <laughs>